This video is just going to look at Newton's laws in a conceptual way. Um, these laws with modern technology and movies about space and things like this have become sort of common knowledge, but we're just going to put them in you know, some more scientific terms and maybe some mathematical terms and then look at what that might mean or how to practice answering questions that are uh, employing these laws to explain how things work in the world. So, Newton's first law. An object in motion tends to stay in motion, or an object at rest tends to stay in rest unless acted on by an unbalanced force. That's sort of the formal language of it. If you've watched the Eureka videos, you've come up with a simpler statement of this, and that is that objects or things like to keep on doing what they're already doing. Um, this concept probably seemed very strange uh, way back in time when... Um, when Newton and, and people were looking at this because objects on Earth are almost always subject to unbalanced forces, especially moving objects. So what it probably seems more like is that all objects are, try, are coming to rest over time. But now that we have a little bit more understanding of things like space or environments where there are really no forces acting on objects, if we imagine an asteroid moving far away from a star, then it would just keep on moving and moving and moving. And uh, so we have a conceptual idea of objects in motion staying in motion. The only thing to add here is that um, if we think about this, then our term for an unbalanced force is the net force. And when we say that they're going to stay in motion or stay at rest or keep on doing what they're really doing, is we're saying that acceleration is equal to zero. So the speed of the object does not change. Not just the speed, but also the direction. They're going at the same speed and in the same direction. So what I'm saying here is that if there's a net force, which is at zero, or it's, it's uh, balanced, adds to zero, then the acceleration will be zero. So mathematically, that is what this law is saying. Keeping in mind net force, just like acceleration, these are vectors. Okay, second law. Second law says that acceleration is directly proportional to force and acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. To put that into, again, simpler language, the more you push on something, the more it's going to speed up. And, and the alternative to that is the heavier that object is, the harder it's going to be to get it moving or to stop it. The harder it is going to be to change its speed. Mathematically, these things look like this. F is proportional to acceleration. Actually, that's not what it says. I'll, I'll do it the way that it says it. Acceleration is proportional to force. Now, we should remember that there could be a large number of forces acting on the object. So when we're considering the net effect on the object or the overall result of the object, really what we mean here is net force. And so really what's meant here, what says acceleration is directly proportional to force, it means net force. And the heavier an object is, the harder it is to start or stop it, so the acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. Now, if we combine those two things into an equation, we could say that acceleration is equal to net force divided by mass. And usually when we have proportionalities like this, we'd have to put in some constant k. But since the same guy who made all this stuff up is the guy who came up with the unit for net force in the first place, he set it up so that that k is just 1 or that it doesn't need to be there. What that means then is that F net is equal to ma and Newton made that the case so that 1 Newton is equal to 1 kilogram times 1 meter per second squared. And so we don't need any constant or any conversion factor to make this equation work. So this makes sense, we all know this, the heavier rock is going to be harder to throw than the lighter rock and the harder you try and throw it, the faster it's going to go. So this law again is, is within our common sense today. The third law is the one that probably gets people hung up still today. And that is for every action force there's an equal and opposite reaction force. Equal means in size 
or magnitude. An opposite means indirection. So when I say there's an equal and opposite reaction force, I mean equal in the size of the force and opposite in the direction of the force. When you push on something, you feel it push back on you. Uh, you do have everyday experience with this. If you imagine picking up a rock and throwing the rock, the fact that you can feel the rock in your hand as you throw it is the reaction force. That's the thing. As you apply a forward force, you feel it pushing back on you. Um, the trick with this law is that people often get confused about the action force and the reaction force acting on the same object. People want to put them, so let's say you push on the baseball and you call that a forward force that you're throwing a baseball. And then you, where's the reaction force there? And you say, well, if there's an action force on the baseball pushing it forward and an equal and opposite reaction force keeping it from going forward, shouldn't the baseball not go anywhere at all? And the, the, the reasoning or the problem with that thinking is that if you push forward on the baseball, the baseball pushes back not on itself, but it pushes back on you. The action force and reaction force do not typically act. on the same object. If they did act on the same object, then you're right, they would cancel each other out and the fact there's an action reaction force would essentially mean nothing's ever going anywhere. But if they're allowed to act on different objects, then they shouldn't, if one's pushing forward and the other one's pushing back, but it's pushing back on something else, then they're not canceling each other out. They're not acting on, not both on the baseball. One would be on the baseball and one would be on the hand. So what we need to do, I'm going to leave that alone. We're going to spend a little bit more time with Newton's third law when we get to it. We'll, we'll do this sort of conceptually and get used to some of these tools. And then we'll come back and we'll go through each law individually and spend a little more time on it and do some of the math of it and stuff like that. But right now, I'm going to just leave that idea of Newton's third law. And when we get to Newton's third law, we'll spend more time on that action-reaction force idea because it is, probably the, it is probably the hardest thing about understanding that law. Okay, what I want to do now is a little bit of practice where I give you a question that describes something in the real world that results from Newton's laws or can be connected to Newton's laws. And what we're going to do is we're going to practice how we write out an answer to these kinds of questions. So the question here, why do you feel like you move to the side of the car when it turns sharply? So here's the situation. You're in a car, you're driving, let's say, 60 kilometers an hour, you're headed and you realize that you are driving past the road that you want to turn on. So you quickly turn there. So you're taking a sharp turn. And what you feel is your body move to the side. Um, so the approach we're going to take here is we're going to use this, uh, this structure to answer these questions. This isn't necessary. It just helps a little bit to organize your thought. Number one, we're going to say what happens. Number two, we're going to state a law that, that causes that to happen. And now and then three, if necessary, we're going to connect what we said happened to the law just to make sure it's really clear. So why do you feel like you move to the side of a car when it turns sharply? Um, so state what happens. You feel like oh, getting ahead of myself there. Like you move to the side of the car because as is, um, because your body attempts to keep moving in the direction
in the direction it was moving before the turn. So what does that mean? Or which law is that? Your body is trying to keep on doing what it's already doing. So this is a Newton's first law example. So we'll say Newton's first law states, and you don't have to say everything it states, you can just answer what applies in this situation. An object in motion An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. So that's the part that applies here. You are in motion, you're staying in motion. So I need to just make a sentence now. I've stated what happens. So you feel like you move to the side of the car because your body attempts to keep moving in the same direction as moving before the turn. Now I've stated the law that applies. Newton's first law states an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. Your body must be forced to turn with the car and so it feels like you are being pulled sideways. Oh, uh, that's, that's not quite right. Um, I'm not sure that's all that clear. I'm going to try that again. Maybe just something to say that your original body direction seems like it, it would be to the side now. The car, having turned, makes your original uh, motion seem to the side of the car. So your body must receive force to turn with the car. Okay, that's a lot of words to answer a simple question like that. I don't know if you will find this particular structure of trying to answer these questions helpful, but that's all it is, is an idea to try and organize your thought. You state what happens. You state the law, and then if you feel it's helpful, you try and connect those two things in a statement that puts it all together. So hopefully that, uh, that will help. I'm going to do a couple more conceptual examples like this in the next video, and then I'm going to talk about free body diagrams.